Welcome everybody to another episode of Animals to the Max and you know what I'm, I'm just gonna say it I'm probably gonna get a lot of flack but I am with my two favorite people in the animal podcast world I love you both Chris and Angie welcome <laughs> Thank you, Corbin. Thank you. It's so good to see you and be talking with you. I've been excited about this all week uh, to talk animals and also to hang out with my buddies as well. I know. So today, I, go ahead, Chris. <laughs> no, I was going to say, what is this, like the, the fourth or fifth one we've done together? I think so. so I think yeah. so. We Amazing. did. Yeah, yeah I, I love I love you guys. Uh, of course, Chris and Angie from the All Creatures podcast. And I love our roundtables because, I mean, we've done, we, we've covered Why Zoos Matter. We've covered wolves. We've covered trophy hunting. And now we're talking about man eaters. <laughs> yes, it's a good topic. It's Especially good topic. with Halloween being around the corner too, right? <laughs> right. And I was a little, cause I love our round tables and I, I feel like our, our listeners do too. Cause it's like, we just like, I guess, you know, animal geeks get together and just get to get into the research and kind of talk about, you know, things that are kind of more controversial. And I was a little, I didn't know how, cause I, I reached out to you and Chris and I was like, Hey, I have an idea for a round table. And I didn't know if you guys are going to be like, what is Corbin? been on like why does he want to talk about man eaters well a little bit yes that's my initial <laughs> but then but we love you and I've always liked to like look at it from all angles and I really started thinking about behavior right that's one of my specialties something I'm really passionate about and really diving into some of the research and then Chris and I as scientists like to always find the data and so I was really, like I said, at first I was a little bit like, I don't know. But the more I thought about it and the more I just started doing a little bit of research, maybe watching a few videos, I dove in headfirst and we've been having fun, like I said, this past week or so preparing for. I probably actually watched more videos uh, on crocodile and other reptilian behavior than I have in a long time and yeah, even yeah. even in preparing for a pod because it's, it's a little bit out of, a little bit out of our comfort zone per se uh but finding the statistics to back some of these numbers up and some of these claims up so no you set me up for a challenge and I, that's why i love you man i appreciate it it was fun yeah, yeah it was uh interesting because today you know just going through through my notes and and just tightening them up and, and reading some stories yeah i think we're gonna bust some myths and then open some eyes today but I'm watching Nat, Nat Geo on TV all day, and like every other commercial is when sharks attack. Sunday at 8.30 when sharks attack. So I guess that's the theme this week. So we definitely will we'll jump into that and, and find some of the truths and, and then talk about some of the, the horror stories that, that actually did happen in history. Yeah. Ooh, they're horror stories. And I know, and Chris was very hesitant. He's like, well, I want to make sure, and, and I, I was hesitant too. I was like, well, we want to make sure the animals are, are in, you know, sh I guess in a good light. And we want to make right. sure we do dispel some myths and misconceptions. But some of these stories are horror stories. I mean, we are yeah. going to talk about some things in history that my mouth dropped. And I'm a huge fan of the All Creatures podcast. I love it. And you guys often talk about how you just go down these rabbit holes where you're doing research on YouTube. I found myself like late at night just watching these random videos about these lions that I did research on. And I just, I totally get what you guys do every week. It's just, it's addicting. Well, yeah. And then, and I think too, if listeners stick with us long enough, of course, we'll have all the crazy stories that are really, yeah, they'll give you the heebie jeebies. That's for sure. Uh, but in the same instance, some of what I found were actually solutions to try to mm -hmm. help reduce some of these human animal conflicts in areas where they're really historically prevalent and that to me just gave me a lot of hope knowing that there are people out there brilliant scientists uh in the field that they're they're actually making documentaries about these scientists and how they're trying to reduce man eaters uh reduce human wildlife conflict and reduce the overall fatalities so i, I that I, I ended on a high note definitely thinking like okay it's not all it's not all doom and gloom but boy <laughs> but it might be but it might be stories because, yeah because no, because we just, uh, you know, a recent interview we had, and we'll, I'll get into it later, but some of these strategies are backfiring. And actually, they true. believe that it's increasing attacks on humans. So we'll talk about that <laughs> when we get to 
you know, the species I'm going to cover later. That's, yeah, that's why I yeah, love like, the data, uh, comparing the numbers, and you got to try something. Not everything you try works, right? Yeah, oh it's very gosh. controversial. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so listeners, so you know what we're going to talk about in this roundtable to for, just kind of get you prepared for what you're going to listen for. I'm going to talk about the man-eating lions of Savo. Oh, yeah. Ooh, and yeah. Angie, Classic. Angie, what are you going to talk about? Probably one of my favorite animals in the world. Well, it is. It's funny. I'm, I'm like, how am I going to talk about crocodiles? To the horse? <laughs> he's like, that's like, he's the croc man. I mean, come on. I, I'm, I'm probably not going to, I hope do you justice by him. I'm going to try, buddy. And maybe you probably know about all these stories or all these historic known crocodile man eaters, but uh, I, I hope to share some insight with you. And I know for me, it was definitely a, a, a fun trip learning a lot more about these enormous reptiles holy macaroni so i looked into a little bit about snakes um but there wasn't too too much and we will talk i know chris is going to talk a lot about some of the um the more deadlier animals and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh but i i shied away a little bit from venom just because that's not necessarily a man eater that's more just a wrong place at the wrong time sure. <laughs> type situation sure and then, Chris, you're going to talk about some of the top 10 deadliest animals, including sharks. <laughs> I was like, what's going on? Is Chris on Instagram on his phone? He's playing the Jaws music. <laughs> I, I thought he was bored already. I'm like, geez, we've been doing this five minutes. I know. On social media. I'm I like, know. hurry, play this song and make sure. He plays right. Yeah, we're definitely going to jump into uh, some of the stuff about sharks. And, you know, if anybody listens to us, and, and, and I know with Corbin shows, you know, talking about some of the truth with sharks. But, yeah, there, there's, there's, a, there's a horror story. From World War II, that's very famous, that we're going to talk about the truth. The sinking of the USS Indianapolis. Uh, there's been movies. In Jaws, they reference it. And w what's the truth? What Were these sailors eaten mostly by sharks? And, you know, what's going on today in the world with sharks and shark attacks? And then, yeah, and then talk about some of the other deadliest uh, creatures around the planet. Awesome, you guys. And by the way, can I just preface this with saying that a lot of the things we're going to talk about are extremely rare like you're more likely to be killed by, you know, in, in, in a car, be killed by a coconut, a cow, than a lot of these animals. So please listen to this with just knowing that these are rare occurrences in history. And uh, as we dive into this, no pun intended. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. There you go. Perfect. Okay, well, I initially reached out because I have been fascinated with the Savo man-eating lions ever since I was a kid. My parents, and I'm looking back like, was this appropriate? I don't know, but my first rated R movie they took me to in the movie theaters was The Ghost in the Darkness in yes. 1996 with Val Kilmer and Michael Douglas. And it's the true story. It focuses on these two man-eating lions who terrorize these railway workers in Africa. And at the end of the movie, it's, I mean, first of all, in, in, in the very beginning of the movie, it says, please be aware the event you're about to see really took place. And then in the end, oh, it, it's so chilling. It says, if you, I'm getting chills right now. If you want yeah. to see the man-eating lions, you could see them at the Chicago Field Museum. Yes. And it's yes. blowing in the wind. I... <laughs> have been fascinated with these man-eating lions for so long. So now I have to ask, Corbin, have you been to the Field Museum? Because it's one of my favorites. Yes, and I'll tell you what, I went with some friends, and no one even cared about the lions. I was like, you guys, these are the most <laughs> famous lions in the world. They're like, yeah, whatever. And I was like, but they're so famous. And it was like, it was the first thing I did. Angie, the first thing I said, where, where are the man-eating lions? They were upstairs or something. I was like, I'm going to go see these lions. And it was so... I stared at that exhibit, I feel like, for over uh, over like 20 to 30 minutes because I looked at the skulls of the lions and I looked at the actual taxidermy, you know, specimens and I thought, oh my God, this is just like, oh, it's just so weird. It gives me chills. Yeah, it's pretty historic. And uh, that's uh, that study that I sent you, they in, they've still used some of the the bone fragments and hair from the specimens yeah. even more recently to do some studies on them. Yes. So, <laughs> you know, when researchers are doing studies from like a hundred years ago to still learn more about why and how this happened, it's a, it's, it's pretty classic. So your friends didn't really know what they were talking about, <laughs> no. but I, I, 
I do have to agree. When you walk in and you see Sue the T Rex, it is that's pretty. That she does steal the show. And yeah, it's I'm pretty famous. Definitely dying to take my kids there. Yeah, no, I, and the Ghost in the Darkness, God, that that movie gave me nightmares. I mean, you know, absolutely. And I still love animals, and I love lions, and I'm and I'm not that. No, I respect them, but. Yeah, that movie, if you've not seen that movie, it's, so it's good. a good little horror film. It's so good, and it got horrible reviews online, Rotten Tomatoes, and I think it's one of the best movies ever made. Like, Robert Ebert said it was the worst movie in history. I thought it was so oh, good. Oh, gosh. It was oh, good. No. It, was yeah, it was, like, good. it was a thriller. I absolutely love The Ghost in the Darkness. I think it's such a good movie. Yeah. No, it's definitely one to see. It's definitely okay. one to see. Okay, so let's go into what really happened because I mm-hmm. was so curious as a kid. So what happened with these famous Savo lions? So what happened was in March of 1898, the British started building a railway bridge over the Savo River in Kenya in very remote Africa. And basically it took a deadly turn when over the next nine months, two male lions attacked and killed several dozen people and it has just gone down in just history as one of the greatest lion killing spree or lion and human killing sprees in history initially um you know they thought that these lions these two male lions had killed over 135 people what we have seen with the research that the field museum has done and they started doing research in 2008 which i can kind of get more in depth where they looked at the looked at the bone and you know and, and looked at their pelts and stuff um but they found that they more than likely killed around 35 or so were Workers, but it's still horrifying. Um, I just want to say that it was so scary. They actually brought in a British officer and engineer, and his name is Lieutenant Col- um, Lieutenant Colonel uh, John Henry Patterson, and he was that civil, civil engineer. And he was there, and when most people fled the scene over those nine months, he stayed and tried to kill these lions, but they evaded him for several months. And... It's just horrific to think that these lions were out around the camp and they just developed this taste for human flesh. And that's kind of uh, kind of the gist of these Savo man-eating lions. I um, actually have a buddy. You could actually stay. This Oh, this gives me chills too. In Savo, <laughs> it's called Man Eater's Camp. And you can... Oh, no. My friend stayed there and almost got yeah. attacked by lions. That's I swear to God, that's a complete different story for a different pod. But I was going to say that you could stay in... It's called Man Eater's Camp along the Savo, and that is where these two male lions attacked and killed all these railway workers. It's like same with the Haunted Mansion or something. You oh, know? I and, know. And these lions, just, just to throw some, some things about the lions, right? These are the shorter mane. Mm-hmm. The males have shorter manes because they're like yeah. desert yeah. lion lions, right? Yeah. yeah, exactly. So we should talk about it because if you do watch yeah. The Ghost in the Darkness, they have these big, beautiful male lions with yeah, these big, yeah. fluffy manes. In Savo, these lions do not have big manes. Matter of fact, some don't even have manes. And the males, if they do have manes, very little hair. And there's a few different theories. One of the theories is because it is so dry and so incredibly hot in Savo, it's so arid, that it would not be energy efficient to have this big mane. It would be too much you know, energy expenditure. Another theory is because in Savo, it's completely thick, full of you know thorns and thick vegetation. A big mane would really get in the way of just trying to kind of get through the vegetation where in the mm-hmm. Serengeti or the Masai Mara, you have these lions with these big, beautiful manes. So they're pretty much maneless lions. And I think it even gives them even, even a creepier appeal when you do see them at the field museum. Cause it's like, what? Like, I don't know. Yeah. It just, yeah, <laughs> it just, uh, it, you know, blew my mind um, just regarding these lions. But I think the big mystery though, is why did these lions attack people? Why? You know, um, and there were several theories uh, just mm-hmm. regarding this, uh, just around, you know, human history. Uh, some people thought that maybe it was food scarcity. So I found this so interesting and I have to give Angie, Angie, thank you for taking me back to my college days because you sent me this scientific paper and <laughs> you, I was like, you oh mean, crap. You mean Professor Adkins? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Yes, yes Dr. No, Adkins. No, thank yeah. you for, for sending me back to, to, my, high, to my, my high school days, my college days. Well, it, it's, it's, a good a, paper. it's a good journal. It's PNAS, which is, mm-hmm. that's mm-hmm. creme de la creme. So it's a good one. Yeah. Yes. I, I loved it though. And I found more information in that than I did actually just searching the actual web that I found on the Smithsonian site and the Field Museum site. But interesting. Interestingly, I found in that read that in the late 19th century, kind of when this stuff happened, they had reduced elephants in the area due to poaching. 
And what happened was with reduced elephants, you basically had an expansion of woodlands and a reduction of that open savanna. Because as we know, elephants, they're like the architects of the landscape. And they absolutely, yeah. they, they create that, uh, the, the open environment for, you know, animals and herbivores in the environment. So when you have woodlands and you basically, a lot of the herbivores left, um, we also have problems with disease during the time. So drought and disease in the late 1800s. It affected wild and domestic bovid. So you had all this stuff, um, all these factors with drought, reduced prey. You had humans who are just completely easy prey. I mean, as you can imagine, right? Like we're like these naked primates. Yeah, <laughs> like are walking Twinkies. I mean, I, oh, yeah. <laughs> seriously, walking Twinkies. But interestingly, they did research and the Field Museum did research back in 2008 and the team of scientists found that these lions actually suffered from uh, severe dental diseases. And one of the lions actually had a canine tooth. I think it was the right tooth. Let me make sure. Hold on. I want to make sure I get the right tooth right for all of our <laughs> listeners. I don't want someone to be like, it was the left. Hold on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a fractured lower right canine. And yeah. not only would that be painful, but lions kill their prey by using the canines and they use their, uh, they suffocate their prey, right? So if you have a fractured canine, that is going to really inhibit your ability to eat prey species. So what would be easier to snack on a human? Yeah. Yeah. Not chasing down those grevy zebras or some of those other uh, species running around there, right? Kudu and, and yeah. things like that. So, yeah. 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 And even in my readings, just as I was looking up crocodile information, there's is a lot on, on carnivores and big cats per se. And I'm sure Chris will cover that when he's talking about some of the more deadlier attacks. But in general, a lot of them had to say upon the animal being captured and killed, because that's usually what ends up happening, uh, upon inspection that there often are some deformity either with the teeth or sometimes with claws or feet. Uh, and so with that injury, the animal basically, like you said, takes easy prey. And mm. then especially carnivores boars being so smart, right? I mean, hunting, that's what they do to survive. And if they learn that prey is easier for them to catch and eat, if they have one of these injuries or issues, then they're going to stick with it. And, mm -hmm. and then you have humans, of course, encroaching on their area more. And as you mentioned, mm -hmm. sometimes a lack of other prey. So it's really a complex issue. It's definitely not one size fits all. And I was trying to find with any of these species, do they actually acquire a taste for, mm. for, for human tissue per se? And I couldn't really find anything that backs that up. I think it more, it ends up being, this is working for me, so I'll keep doing it. Mm -hmm. And I also couldn't find, I was curious to know, like if there was a mom that was a man eater, if she passed that behavior along mm. to one of her cubs, but, uh, I'll need more time and more digging. I'm not, I'm not going to give up yet knowing that answer. Mm. Uh, but to truth be told, who knows some, some live long, a little bit long, but a lot of times when they're known to be man eaters are usually unfortunately, but I also understand how I have to be, uh, captured and often killed. Yeah. So yeah. they probably don't get to pass on their genes theoretically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and it's, go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to jump in with some of the other lion statistics, if you want me to, yeah. to kind of, you know, li lions per year on average kill about 100 people, uh, mostly in, in Africa. I, I didn't see any statistics in India where you have that, that small subpopulation there. Um, the stats I did find in, in Tanzania over 14 years, lions killed over 560 people, mm -hmm. injured over 300. So, you know, not tons, but there is some, some other uh, data. There was a, a, a lion, I, I couldn't find the full study on it, called Osama, uh, killed at least 34 people in the Rufiji River. Mm -hmm. So there, there was a man-eater there. And over a period of a year and a half in Mozambique, so this is probably a big spike, uh, lions killed seven, 70 people in oh. Cabo Delgado. Oh province God. so and you know what it is is you know people late at night out there protecting their crops or uh, i read some of the, the the lion attacks that happened in kruger or illegal immigrants coming in from mozambique into south africa and the lions are out at night you know and, and they come across people and they're either scared or 
an attack or just, hey, that's an easy meal. But I mean, I think we're kind of bony, right? I mean, I don't know, humans. I hear, I, I hear, we taste like pork. Isn't that weird? Yeah, okay. How do I, how do I know this? I was like, how do I know that we taste like pork? I swear, I feel like I know that we taste like well, pork. Well, I'm, I think that's a, I mean, that's I think if you eat healthy, that's a compliment. I'm sure there's a lot of us, myself included, that probably taste like Doritos, just not. <laughs> Not very uh, yummy things for carnivores. So whenever I'm doing an education set with little kids and they're always like, oh, my God, is that snake going to eat me or whatever I'm holding in my hand? I always just like to make it light and fun and say, no way. I mean, you taste like Twinkies and Doritos. Yuck. You know, and they, they laugh and then they can have a little bit more appreciation that, yeah, the, the snake generally doesn't have any interest in eating you. You yes. don't we don't taste good. But you know what? So, you know what I have to say though about my these man my man eaters these man eaters which is just gives me chills is that usually man eaters are solo so the fact that these two cooperatively work together to kill was interesting and once again Angie you sent me that amazing scientific paper here's what it says what I found digging through that eyewitness reports say that the attacks um, suggest that one lion, one of the male lions initially was responsible for the attacks while the other waited in the brush. And then they started working together and they don't know if they think these lions were litter mates, lifelong partners, but they kind of learned from each other, but they were together. Usually man eaters are solo. So that's what I think gives this story more chills. Sure. No, it's super fascinating. It's definitely a historic crazy scary time i mean and those workers were just out there trying to do their best and what i mean they don't really have a lot of def their own of their own defenses and yeah no it's it's there's a reason they're in the field museum in chicago that's for sure yeah, yeah. yeah. there there really is and i just found it so these guys were just relentless and i also found that in there because basically so i guess so what happened after nine months i should say how you know uh, colonel pattison colonel pattison shot one of them in mm -hmm. December of uh, 1898, and then he killed the other one three weeks later. So it took nine months for them to kill them. And he used them as rugs, as like floor rugs for many years. And then in 1925, he sold them to the Field Museum for $5,000. He sold their actual pelts. But what's interesting is that their pelts had several scars, um, where they could see where the lions were literally going through that thorny vegetation in Savo, mm -hmm. kind of going through the bomas. And I found that so fascinating that it was just, they just mm -hmm. were relentless. Oh. God, imagine living during that time. That's the fear, you know. Just, God. Oh my goodness. Oh. No. Now, it, no. Go ahead. Yeah. No, as I say, in some of the the other big cats, the only data point I could find was tigers mm. uh, kill about fifty people a year, which I find interesting, probably because there's more human wildlife conflict per tiger in the world. I mean, because what there's twenty eight hundred tigers in the wild mm. versus what twenty thousand lions. Mm -hmm. So there's more of a human wildlife conflict, I think, there, even though it's half the numbers of people killed. So, you know, and and, and Angie, I don't know if you found any data on leopards or any other big cats. Uh well, I did I was personally really shocked being a huge leopard fan and yeah. as all of our listeners know, it's like my dream to see one in the wild. And of course I have three <laughs> times Africa. No luck. Nope. Neither have nope. I. Oh, my God. They just evade us. My goodness. Yes. yes. Okay. I guess it gives us a reason to live and keep going back, perhaps. <laughs> but I think, because, I don't know why, but so I was really shocked when I was just, of course, browsing and just trying to get my feet wet learning about some of this data. And I came across an, uh, an article from World Atlas that lists some of the top uh, top 10 or 20 man. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. It adds a sound effect. I want to keep it in. It's yeah. scary. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I know. Oh yeah, I know. I just fixed my ringer too. Usually it's on. Yeah, usually it's on mute. What is that? Uh, the psycho soundtrack? <laughs> I think so. My, hus my husband set it up for me, so I mean, you know. My God. I <laughs> know. Uh, but yeah, I was really surprised and shocked and somewhat disappointed. I don't know if that's the right word, but to to find that leopards were in the like top. Four. or not not the top four but there were four out of ten slots were taken by leopards like known man-eating leopards mm -hmm. and I, I didn't dig too much into the data about it but I don't know Chris if you found anything that confirms that but there definitely throughout history there's been the leopard of Panar the leopard of central provinces of India the leopard of 
ooh, I'm not going to say this right, but Ruta Payag in northern India and Leopard of Gumalapar. And we're talking about, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 alleged victims of these animals until they're typically hunted down. And so, yeah, that one for me was a little bit shocking. And, as, and then as Chris mentioned, I, Tiger was only on there like once. The yeah. Tiger's uh, Chogoth. Now, there are definitely... A, in more incidents of tigers and tigresses. A lot of times they are females that have been known to be so-called man-eaters. But, uh, you know, they're usually, once again, they're usually captured or uh, they, don't, they don't really stick around a long time maybe to get that high of numbers. But I don't know what you found, Chris, but with the tiger attacks, I did find that there are, especially uh, – and India too, mm -hmm. because tigers are somewhat sacred and often protected by the government uh, as they are trying to get the numbers to rebound. So there's this, it's not, it's, it's hard for them to necessarily uh, hunt a tiger. And so they, mm -hmm. I think there has to be either permission or something or mm -hmm. some kind of proof of like, okay, it, we think it has, you know, injured or attacked or killed this many people, but they are trying to prevent attacks in general. And so uh, there's an example of in 1986 in Sunda Barnes, mm -hmm. uh, it's thought that tigers typically always attack from the back and yeah. then jump on their prey and not the front. And so while they were trying to figure out why these certain tigers were attacking people and whatnot, uh, the villagers would wear protection with eyes basically like on their backside Mm -hmm. So that they could either see the tiger from the front and then figure out what to do, but at least hopefully the tiger wouldn't attack them from the back. And so I thought that was really clever. And, and when we talk about human tiger or other cat or carnivore conflict, I thought that was really a unique strategy to try to detour them from attacking you from the back. Um, but they also did like uh, electrified human dummies to try to associate a negative stimulus, basically, like a little bit of um, uh, re negative reinforcement, if you will, or actually it's punishment. Um, but that didn't work very well. So the What's tiger attack. <laughs> yeah, what? And, well, I didn't and know I'll, about the electrified and I, dummies. Yeah, and, <laughs> yes, and I'll bring that up too when I get to crocodile because there's been some really interesting research on trying to prevent it because a lot of these animals are – either threatened or endangered or their numbers like for instance tigers gosh it's been a while since chris and i have talked about tigers but man 67 percent of them have disappeared in india over a hundred years 67 yeah. percent so it's like they're trying to figure out how to work together with them um but uh, um, i didn't find any solutions for any of the leopard conflicts out there i don't know if you did this at all my my question for you is we're having the the masks with the eyes behind them was that effective at all or did it even work well that's where i i, I couldn't find anything in in the scientific literature it just said like oh they think that it worked mm. for a little while and um definitely worked better than the electrified human dummies yes. um <laughs> so but you know i, I don't i, I don't remember. think I, this is this is about 20, 30 years ago. So I don't, yeah. I don't know if that's stuck. Now I will say, I don't have the data in front of me, but uh, an article just came across my late night readings. Cause yes, I am that big a dork uh, that researchers in, I think it was in South Africa did a five year study of painting eyes on the rear ends of cattle, grazing cattle. Uh, and we're able to show that it uh, reduced the number of, cat or carnivore um, livestock conflict. And so they are continuing to follow it up. It was somebody's uh, student's dissertation. And basically after five years, it was like, wow, this is actually working or we think it is. So they're following up with it and with on more farms and things like that. And so, yeah, big old eye. It, it was funny if you, you can probably find it online if you just Google it. But the picture of the, the cow booty or rump with the big old eyes on it, eyes you on know. It, yeah. So. I, so it might. I think we need more scientific research to to, to back that claim. Um, but that's what that's what this, uh, this the student's dissertation was really really hopeful of. Like, wow, how great would this be if it stopped the you know the carnivores, the big cats killing livestock because then ultimately they get killed um, yeah. from farmer retaliation.
Yeah, I found in in. Do you want to hear what I found in my scientific findings, Angie? You ready for this yeah. one? Uh, I <laughs> found <laughs> no. I'm saying that paper you sent me. They said the scientists or the the researchers believe that the dietary specialization on humans of lions eating humans may be a long standing fallback strategy among lions. However, the risk associated with eating humans it doesn't outweigh or it it often um, outweighs the nutritional benefits. There's a lot of risk. So once again, a lot of lions do not go that route. But when they're pushed to extremes um, where we have low prey numbers, where we have habitat um, destruction, where humans are in their environment. I mean, I didn't even mention this, but in Savo, where the man-eating lions were, they were throwing out slaves and people who were mm-hmm. being killed by the, by, the, uh, by flies and, and disease, and they were throwing out these bodies. So imagine all this food they were scavenging. I mean, they probably yeah, acquired bait. a taste. It's like bait. Yeah. It's like yeah. they probably acquired a taste for our flesh. I think it's a number of factors. I don't think it's just one thing that caused these man eating lions. But once again, it, it just goes down in history as one of my favorite uh, stories. And I know we, <laughs> I know, I know we have a bunch to get to, so we'll get to your guys' animals, but the Savo lions, I cannot recommend yeah. the ghost in the darkness. Um, it's such a good movie. <laughs> Well, yeah, and a, and a field museum. I cannot. I was meaning to take my boys there this summer when I was up north visiting, but yep. of course, uh, can't really go anywhere. But yes. hopefully next summer, it's on my bucket list, and I'll take a picture with us, and yes. we'll probably be the only three dorks down there. Oh, but we'll do it. Oh, oh, one, one, one quick thing. So I'm such a dork, right? These, so the the two lions they used in Ghosts in the Darkness, they had the big fluffy manes. Their names were Caesar and Bongo, and they were actually from a zoo from the Bowmanville Zoo in Ontario, Canada. I had one of my buddies, Dave Salmoni. He's a large cat expert for Animal Planet. I had him on my podcast, you know, mm. Animals to the Max. He worked with these lions and trained them for Ghost in the Darkness. And oh, I. Okay. I was That's like, cool. it was That's so cool. Circle. Oh, it yeah. was so cool. Like I was like so starstruck and Dave yes. and we've all met celebrities. Chris, I know you've met multiple, but yeah. I don't care. But when I was like, wait, yeah. you worked with the actual lions. Like I was yeah, just, yeah, yeah. one of the lions actually, I think almost killed Dave. Anyway, that's interesting. Oh. No, seriously. <laughs> inter- no, really. Yeah. It goes full circle. Okay. So I'm done with the Savo lions, but fascinating, fascinating tale. No. And it's, it's interesting. Cause I, I, it, it just dawned on me. We're talking about all this stuff. And I'm like, didn't we forget during the beginning of lockdown, we did our little tiger talk. Yes. With- <laughs> yeah, <that was> exotic. <laughs> tiger I thinking King. about all those tigers. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, good old USA. So, it, but it, it's also interesting. Some of the other big cats, you know, I wanted to address real quick cougars, mm-hmm. you know, what less than one a year. We, we don't hear about cougars, you know, killing people in the United States uh, in, in you know Central America, jaguars numbers are really low. So it's it's you know when you look at India or you look at Southeast Asia, you look at the human population to the land. You know that's where you're getting a lot of this wildlife conflict. So when Angie talks about leopards, you know it's clicking in my head. Well, when we look at most of like when I'm going to talk about snakes, a lot of snake bites are in Southeast Asia. You know where you know people walking through to the the tropical rainforest, you know, they run across a snake and they get bit and they die because they don't have access to antivenom or a hospital, things like that. So, you know, when you look at all these things, we specifically talk lions. I mean, that one's just, it's just crazy. So it's a good story. It's a good story. It is. I mean, not if you're involved with it, but I mean, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. I have a question. Would you two stay in man eaters camp? Ooh. Yeah, I would. I would. Yeah. I think so. A trip to Africa. Are you paying? No. Yeah. Like- <laughs> yeah. Can we find? <laughs> By the way, anyone listening, can you sponsor the three of us? We will go to Man Eaters Camp and do a live we'll podcast. Film it. Yes, we'll do some live stuff. Yes. <laughs> oh then my god. Absolutely. That's so I'll funny. be crying if I hear lions. No, up. honestly, though, anything, to, anything to get me to Kenya. And I've heard lions at night. And I, I've, I've, uh, that was in um, Tarangiri National Park in, uh, in uh, Tanzania. And it was fine for me. I mean, because we we have guards, and they just say basically, if you have to go to the bathroom, hold it at yeah. nighttime. Oh, exactly. And don't oh, leave your yeah. tent. And you know, what so I don't understand though. In Africa, I was fine with- we, we had guards too, but he would just the mosque would walk around. And all he had was a stick, and I'm sitting here thinking, like, that's great, but what <laughs> the hell are you gonna do if a hippo comes out? Like, I'm serious. I know, like, I know. what? It makes no yeah. sense. You got to kind of throw faith in the wind and just, uh, they, you know, no hope they know what they do, they're doing and they, and they seem to. Right. So, yeah. uh, yeah, no, no, I would, I, I love all that. And, and hearing the elephants and of course the, 
the popos, the hippos at night. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Sign me up anytime. So absolutely. Yes. Even if, uh, I just have to get some money first, if, unless we get sponsored. <laughs> yeah, 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 to go, to go, to go. Absolutely. So why don't we go into, now that we are talking about all these dangerous animals, Chris, I know you mentioned you had a list of the top 10 most right. dangerous animals. And I think people are going to be surprised about what yeah. the number one animal is. Like, it, if you're it, it listening, is. what do you think yeah. it is? <laughs> it's so yeah, shocking. Put in your head what you think if you think the most dangerous, quote unquote, animal is in the world we'll get to it um I do, I do have data from the united states too just you know trying to find scientific numbers you know i would say in the united states besides i know hornets wasps and bees kill about 500 people a year hmm. that that was pretty high other mammals that is a classification they had that was over 650 a lot of that's livestock wow cows hmm. horses other animals i work with on a daily basis yes. between mosquitoes and horses here in florida <laughs> forget serious. about it i'm lucky to still be here i'm right? happier on yeah. a round table this might be your last pod <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Right. So, that would be such so an here, oxymoron here. you die like after we die, talk about yeah. man eaters so here it's, here's... Been, it's been a good ride so no, no regrets <laughs> yeah so here's some other surprising ones on the list that won't be on the top 10 deadliest rats on average, kill three people a year in the United States. Wow. Yeah. Oh, that's uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I know, uh, well, alligators are really low in the U.S. We've, sure. we've talked about that. Scorpions. Okay, scorpions kill yeah. five people a year in the U.S. So mm-hmm. centipedes, too. What? So, yeah. Centipedes? <laughs> what a way to go. My God, oh, really? Oh, oh. That's oh. just horrible. Yeah. So those are some of the animals you, you don't really hear about, you know, that, that they, they can. It probably is allergic reactions, things like that. Now, I don't want to take away any of Angie's uh, thunder, but the world's top 10, and, and there's different lists out there. So I kind of course. looked at the numbers, and and Angie's going to get to this one because there are some horrifying stories about this. But the 10th ten, deadliest animal on the planet is the crocodile mm-hmm. and kills – about a thousand people per year. Mm-hmm. And that's just what we know. And they think it's really going to be a lot more than that because, yeah, and I, and I don't know, Angie's going to get into it and I can jump in there, but it's the now crocodile kills more people than say the salties. Mm. So in Africa, uh, that's, that's where they see a lot of the, the, the problem crocs actually. So here's busting a new myth that, that I didn't know. Crocs actually kill more people in Africa than hippos. So a lot, you know, hippos we always thought was number one. Mm -hmm. Actually, the now crocodile has now taken it over because there's a lot more human wildlife conflict in Africa. Right. Well, and hippo can't be on the man ear list because they do kill a lot of people uh, for territorial reasons in Africa, but they're they're not going to eat them. No. That's that's they're doing it more for defense and aggression, and you're in my territory or it's breeding season, things like that. Um, So. They're not technically a man eater. They're just a man killer. <laughs> so, <laughs> they're so scary. I it's laugh. still <laughs> horrifying. I know, right? It's, oh, my God. They're just so cute. You know, I, mean, I, I, I would remember never learning know. that they were even in the top 10, and it was just shocking, you know? Yeah. 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 All right. Number nine is is going back to scorpions. Wow. So these aren't man eaters. Mm-hmm. Scor- scorpion's not going to eat you, but it, does, it can kill you. So what they – estimate is 1.2 million people per year stung by scorpions and about 4,000 people per year die mostly tropics and subtropics in undeveloped countries it's, it's like the death rate's like 0.27 percent it's really low but they do ex- you know kill a lot of people uh the world number eight is a roundworm so that's an internal parasite that kills about 4,500 people per year the world number number seven deadliest animal, and, and remember, insects are classified as animals, so that's why they're on this list. If we were going to talk mammals or, or reptiles or fish, I mean, all that, you have to include insects. So the, the, the kissing bug or the assassin bug oh. kills, yeah, over 12,000 people per year in the Americas. What? So this is in the, yes, this is in the U.S. too. It's Chagas disease. So it transmits a parasite, which will kill you. So Google a picture of the assassin bug. So you don't 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 mess with that one. Uh, world number six, uh, CC fly, Sub-Saharan Africa. You guys know that. You've been there. 
uh, something you have to watch out for. Uh, five to 10,000 people per year causes sleeping sickness. Again, a parasitic infection with the bite. World number five. Oh, Angie, one of our favorites. Our, our, our companions. What is it? You two, Corbin. What is it? What is it? What is it? <laughs> oh, oh dogs. Dogs. Fido, oh, yeah. man. 17,000 deaths per year due to dogs around the world. That is not including rabies. Mm. So I was just going to ask, is that disease or is that more like attacks? That's dog attacks. Wow. Dog attacks. Rabies. Just rabies in Asia kills an estimated 35,000 people per year. Wow. I couldn't get a, a worldwide... Uh, 21,000 in Africa due to rabies. So dogs, uh, yeah, are, are, are baby dogs. 10 most dangerous breeds. I don't even know if I want to go down here. Oh, let's do I mean, it. Okay. Number 10, Great Dane. <laughs> it's the most dangerous. They're huge. Uh, boxer. Does it sit on people? Is it <laughs> that <laughs> right? No, it I, chases I, them down. Uh, <laughs> they're beautiful. I took care of one for a few days. I, I never want one of those again. It was, Why? It was huge. Chewed everything. It was a puppy. It was, but it was huge. Too big. Okay. <laughs> yeah, they're huge. Uh, boxer was surprising. So okay. boxer's in there. This wasn't surprising. Wolf hybrid. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah you, a terrible pet. Uh, Angie, Alaskan Malamute. Sorry. Oh. Or Siberian Husky. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm a Husky fan. Yeah, um, I know. Yeah, I can see that. They have their minds of their own for sure. Yep. Yeah. Bull Mastiff. Uh, Doberman Pinscher. Oh, I heard German. those are really aggressive. Yeah. Yeah, German Shepherd, Rottweiler, of mine, yeah. Yeah. and then Pitbull. Oh, uh, I and have a Pitbull. I'm a Pitbull dad. Uh, are have, Pitbulls uh -huh. number one, or is it Rots? Yeah, yeah. But I, I, some of that, I think, is training, and it's not just the breed. I mean, you know, it, it was kind of the cool thing to keep a Pitbull and for fighting. I don't know. I had a Pit Mix. She was a beautiful dog. Yeah, every, every, yeah, every Pit Mix that I've ever known or interacted with has been literally – some of the best dogs ever, but they had yeah. great owners and yeah. all of that. So, hmm. yeah, but that's another pod for another day. Oh you know? my God. You just thought of another, Oh, this is great. We could continue Next our round table. Everybody <laughs> wants to know about this. This is important information. Okay. We, we're going to yeah. save it. We'll say, put that on hold. That'd be a good right. one. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. World number four, sand fly, another insect, uh, Africa, East Africa, Brazil has a lot of cases. Uh, 24,000 people per year die, transmits a parasitic disease. Southeast Asia is actually working to eradicate it, and they're actually getting close. Hmm. All right, world number three, one of your favorites, Corb. Uh... All right. I know, our, our snakes, hmm. uh, they kill, and this is old data, kills about 60,000 people per year. It's probably over 100,000. The World Health Organization estimates about 5.4 million snake bites occur per year. Oh. And 2.7 million of those are from venomous snakes. So there's a, up to about 140,000 deaths per year or rough, or no, no, sorry, 140,000, not including deaths, but like the, the uh, amputations or permanent disabilities, things like that. A lot of this is happening in the poorer nations because they don't have access to antivenom. United States, the, the, the data is like six people per year die. Yeah, United snakes is really very low. The, the United snakes, very, excuse me. The United, yeah. <laughs> I, <love laughs> I did not mean to do that. The United that States. That might become our new name. <laughs> things keep going the way they are. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So. But that, that's that's a huge problem. I mean, that's something that we should try, you know, that the, the World Health Organization is working to, uh, after we get out of this COVID night, nightmare, um, to get antivenom in these poor regions. And like I said, I know doing, when we did our King Cobra episode, a lot of snake bites happen in Southeast Asia. You know, again, you have that wildlife, human-wildlife conflict. All right, number two. Well, there's three of us in the room. So humans, we on average kill about 580,000 people oh, per wait, year. We're on the list? Yes, we're the world's number two deadliest animal. Oh, I thought we'd be so. number one for sure. Okay. Well, well there's I mean, something I actually, <laughs> actually, never mind. I take that back. Okay, number you two. Know, number one is. Yep. But I, I, maybe during certain years, like during wars, that might spike. I mean, you know, during World War II or something like that was pretty horrific. But yeah, good old humans were number two. And then number one. Everybody's favorite, the mosquito kills over 800,000 people per year. Oh. And yeah, the, it, it's, it's malaria. 
the good thing is the world is working hard to reduce that. So they're actually cutting down on, you know, how many people die per year from, from malaria. It really, you know, affects the poor around the world. So the mosquito actually kills way more people than any other quote unquote animal hmm. on earth. So most of these are insects. I mean, yeah. when we talk about, you know, jaws or like when Angie and I, I remember our first episode, the first shark, we covered a great white, obviously. And she was so angry. She's like, don't talk about Jaws. It just it ruins <laughs> the world of sharks. You know, it just poor sharks. Yeah, I had to do like a thesis in undergrad about it. And that's oh, when I did. started realizing like how, how much it really just left a negative impact, not only on myself, but because I grew up in Lake Michigan. So it's no salt, no sharks is literally on a T-shirt that – you know, is sold throughout Michigan and it does make it wonderful, but yes, but, it, but trying to understand some of the dynamics before, when you watch these shows like jaws, which we all did in the eighties and nineties and things like that, that it, it, yeah, left a really big scar on people. Uh, and it's to this day, there's still a ton, a ton of shark human conflicts. I mean, poor sharks. I mean, hundreds of thousands of them are killed a year, maybe over, millions. Over, over 100 million. Over 100 uh -huh, okay. million. Okay, oh my gosh, yeah, there you yeah. go. And yeah. it's disgusting. Not a fair fight. Not no, a fair the shark fight fin soup, and anyway, we that's a different pod in itself, but yeah, sharks yeah. are... I wonder if, has Steven Spielberg ever publicly talked about that regarding his jaws and if he ever felt bad for... I wonder if he ever felt bad for giving sharks such a bad yeah. persona. The author of Jaws did... Uh, okay. Peter Benchley was his name, I think, okay. who wrote Jaws. He 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 regretted what happened because wow. because he you know and and we'll get to to sharks here in a minute, but uh, you know this fear of the ocean. I had it since I was a kid. You know, I'd joke around with Angie during that podcast. I I would run up my stairs afraid Jaws was going to jump out of my carpet and eat me. I mean, just you know, irrational fear due to that movie. Um, just really quickly because I think we want to get to Crocs real sure, quick. Sure. Sure. Angie's got some interesting stuff there. Elephants, uh, it's rare, but they do kill uh, people. Uh, the only data point I could find on elephants, about 100 people a year are, are killed by elephants uh, across the world. And that includes Asians, too. Uh, hippos, 500. Uh, the box jellyfish, this is one. Angie, we're going to cover the species soon. It kills up to 50 people per year in the Philippines. We don't have worldwide data. This is a nasty, nasty, nasty jellyfish. Duh, jellyfish. Very dangerous, very dangerous. So that's probably in the hundreds around the world. Uh, wolves kill about 10 people a year. Bears kill about five people a year. Hmm. Total. Around the world. Total. So we're so scared of these animals, wolves especially. You know, it's just the data is not there. There's no, there's no reason to be really, really frightened from these animals. You know, mm -hmm. we kill way more of them than, than they kill of us. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Chris, that was so fascinating. I shocked by a few of them, the sand fly, like what? And, <laughs> yeah. and I want to say insects. something. I, so I've been to Africa twice. Angie, when I was there twice, I did not see one mosquito. <laughs> yes. I can't remember. It's so funny you mentioned that, Corbin. I can't remember yeah, the last couple times. I think the first time I went, uh, I think I did like actually use the mosquito net I brought sure. for like over my bed or uh, whatever. Um, but more recently, this last time, and I was in, I was in uh, Kruger, so in, in Joburg area. Of course, you take the malaria pills, and then they're, you, know, you got to go to the doctor and get them, and they mm. cost money and all this and that. And I didn't see one darn mosquito. And I was there in October mm -hmm. and Kruger. And I don't know if it was a seasonality thing or just like, I was only there for like four or five days. It was pretty in and out, unfortunately for a conference, but yeah, it's funny. You mentioned that. Where were you when you didn't see any in Kenya? So the Mase Mara, okay. Nairobi, mm -hmm. Lake Nakuru, I didn't see one mosquito. And, and I, wow. and I was young and I, you know, I'd take them, you know, the malaria pills and you get all the sure. shots, but not one, not one. Yeah, slept with the nets and everything. At first, when I walked in, I know this makes me sound so dumb, but I was, it's the first time in Africa, and I was a kid, and I was like, oh my God, look at these. I thought the nets were like some weird decor. I was like, that is so sure. weird. I was like, <laughs> that is weird. So I Like, you know what I mean? And then I was like, oh, wait, hello, light bulb. It's just weird because we're from America. We don't sleep with nets over us. It's just mm -hmm. all sure. a different experience, you know? Sure. Yeah. And how old were you when you went for the first time? I'm just curious because of, of, oh, I wonder when I should take my boys. Oh, I was 22. 
And oh, I went okay. after college. Yeah, yeah. But you should okay, take your so boys you soon. Down. That'd be expensive, though. Maybe it'd be a good I, that's time. That's the problem. I mean, I've got many years of saving up before that ever happens. But <laughs> Yeah, but they're so, I bet they would love it. Have you taken them to Yellowstone yet? No, we haven't really done much. Uh, I do it first. Know, they're, they're six and four, so. Yeah. Uh, they've got to go to uh, Disney's Animal Kingdom because we have friends that work there that get us in for free. Oh, Thank that's... you, Shana. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. <laughs> <Give her shout-out. laughs> okay, that's so awesome. Okay, so back on to the okay. podcast. Let's talk about uh, my favorite, crocodiles. What, Angie, you're a crocodile expert today. I just... Yes, and speaking of my kids, here's actually my son, Zachary, who's four. Uh, Zachary, can you make a crocodile noise? Oh, he's being shy. He, uh, <laughs> oh, he has a crocodile right here. Look at <gasps> it. Oh, oh my there God. You go. Zachary, it's one of his stuffies. What's her name? You got to talk in the microphone. What's her name? Sparkles. Oh, Sparkles. <laughs> nice. What, what color is Sparkles? Uh, blue and pink and purple. Blue, pink, and purple. Yes. And she has a little bit of sparkles on her too. So okay. very she, accurate. She has a, she has a bandaid on her. She must have a boo-boo, right? <laughs> and does she go to school with you every day? Yeah. yeah. Does she have her own seat at school? Yeah. Yeah. The teacher made her her own seat. So. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so, okay. Well, Zachy, mama's got to keep working. Can you go, can you go see what daddy's doing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he gets a he gets a, a b minus for babysitting right now no he just <laughs> that's fine i love the kid cameos seriously oh my gosh oh wait he is babysitting he's just not giving zacky what he wants <laughs> honey i know it's hard but you need to listen to him and we'll talk as soon as i get done okay okay thank you for being so understanding <laughs> oh, sorry for laughing oh, no it's uh zacky do you want to go to africa and see wild animals can you say a little louder? Yeah. What's the number one animal you want to see in Africa? Um, zebra. Zebra. Oh, oh Angie, you're, you're brainwashing Mom. him. Yeah. Oh, my I, God. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, okay. don't. <laughs> I hear Daddy calling you, so bye, sweet boy. Thank you. A zebra. Oh, Angie. Zebra. Oh, my God. I just, like... I mean, that was like the best thing that ever happened to me this month, I would say, him answering that. That was not, I did not tell him to answer that. So he's just, he <laughs> must really want boy. something from me, I think. But. Oh my God, so funny. <laughs> but that's cute how he had, a, yeah, one of his favorite stuffies is a, um, a crocodile or an alligator. I think it's technically an alligator because we, I did take him on an Ever an uh, Everglades boat ride this mm-hmm. uh, this summer. Okay. And we saw, of course, a lot of, a lot of alligators, a lot of birds oh my gosh so amazing and we actually saw hatchling a whole uh, like 10 or 12 um baby alligators or hatchlings that were like you know about nine inches long and they were just the cutest thing ever i was in love so but he picked up a stuffy there now she goes to school with him and her name is sparkles but yes so crocodiles sorry about that everyone this is my life. People are like, how do you do it all? I'm like, I yeah, don't. I this is- <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Especially during the lockdown. It's been insane. Yeah, yeah, it's been busy. But at any rate, uh, so crocodiles, this is a fun one for me to learn more about because, yeah, they're not necessarily uh, – whenever Chris and I cover a reptile or a bird, I'm always still learning about them, and that's probably why I just watched literally like three or four documentaries on them. But – in general, I mean, I'm sure Corbin knows this, but there's about 13 species of crocodiles. But I think, as Chris mentioned, the Nile is the Nile croc is usually the one related to attacks and or fatalities, as is the saltwater croc, uh, but a little bit lower in numbers than the Nile Nile croc. And with all the research that I was doing and and video watching and things like that, it's always why and. It, Corbin, you brought this up about the Savo lions. It's like, well, why attack a human? And there's different theories. And Africa, obviously, is a huge continent. And so different, the croc, the crocs are all over. And so it depends on the region. Like, like you said, if it's up in the desert, it's dry. There might not be a lot of other food. There might not be, they might be competing with water, uh, with some of the local villagers, things like that. Uh, but typically... The attacks will happen through their ambush opportunistic predators. And so the attacks will happen when people are in the water doing their laundry mm. and needy are on the water's edge or fishing and things like that. And it's different for us here living in the United States and probably for some of our listeners in Australia and Canada and things like that. But 
of course, in Africa and a lot of other countries, the river is like the source of life. I mean, the, the people that live near near it have to travel there daily for water, for washing. Uh, it's part of their daily life. It's not like me in Florida. Like if I don't want to go to a river here in Florida, I don't have to ever. I don't, there's no need for me to. And so it's just a totally different lifestyle. And because of that, there's going to be a lot more interactions of crocodiles in in Africa, especially than like, let's say in US with alligators, right? Or, or our, um, the American crocodile as well. And so researchers speculate that they are they attack humans for food, of course. Uh, they see it. It's moving. Mm. Bada boom, bada bang. You know, snap, here we go. Uh, another one that's typically seen more in Florida, at least, is uh, defensive territory mm. and or defensive young. And so, it, or breeding season, right? If you're male mm. during breeding season, uh, you might just be angry at anything that comes near you or near your water where you're at. And... Then some researchers say, too, that it might be like mistaken identity, that they might be going after an animal accompanying a person, like if it's a dog mm. or something like that, or if they're fishing, you know, maybe going after the fish and not necessarily the person, but they're just so powerful. And so there's 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 definitely several reasons of why. And like I said, I couldn't find that they actually love the taste of humans. That's not necessarily one, but as I was doing my research, and I know you can back me up on this, Corbin, and I have some fun stories here in a second, but crocs are super smart. Oh, and yeah. And so when we – definitely probably the smartest reptile, oh, right? Oh, yeah, 100%. And so – which this is this is why I love doing these podcasts because I, I, I watch all these cool videos and was watching all this amazing training that they're doing with crocs and stuff. It was just phenomenal. And But because of that, so when we think about a man-eater, and I'm going to go over the three historic man-eaters – uh, of crocodiles here in a second, if they do get the taste, if they do learn that this is an easy target, like a small child by the water or a woman with her back turned doing the wash, that because they are so smart, then yes, they might continue doing that. Um, and in general, most of the crocodiles that attack humans are larger in size, so they need bigger prey. And there's speculation too, depending on where the regions that are known for higher crocodile attack incidents that there might be like less fish in the water or decline in birds or just mm -hmm. other natural prey, similar to what you were saying with the Sava lions. And so they're almost forced to do that or they're a really, really large croc and they know not to mess with the hippos usually. So, cause they, that's their own, they have their own little language there between the hippos and the crocs. And so they're basically looking for another large food source, if you will. But in general, looking at the numbers, it's, hard to obtain real data as Chris mentioned like there's a number thrown out there a thousand worldwide a year but it's hard it's it's hard to know for sure because it depends on the year depends on the region and of course most of these attacks happen in really impoverished remote rural areas that are having political unrest and they're just not mm -hmm. reporting a lot of these things or if or if they are then when a researcher maybe comes to the village they maybe aren't getting like accurate numbers or data when this in the, when the victims are telling them about the story so a lot of it is it's it's hard but it de as chris mentioned there i mean they're definitely in the top 10 obviously uh as far as attack attacks and kills of humans but just briefly like in the united states following suit with what chris said about cougars and bears and wolves we just typically don't have as big of issue with it and so in the u.s from let's see uh, August, or from 1948, so a long time ago, mm -hmm. to about 2004, there was a fair amount of injuries, about 376 injuries and only 15 deaths uh, from alligators in the U.S. And so, and there's actually more in Florida than in Louisiana, and they think that's due to a larger population in Florida, people being more by the waterways in Florida, um, and then also the colder weather in Louisiana, which I was like, it's colder in Louisiana than Florida, but... Mm -hmm. uh, a little bit slightly cooler, so not as many alligators probably live in that region. So it's a, a, a population density thing. And now in our one of our favorite continents, Australia, that's mm -hmm. where they have the salties. Um, from 1971 to about 2013, some of this data is dated because it takes a while to collect. Uh, there was 18 fatal attacks, mm -hmm. but anywhere between 45 and 102 non-fatal attacks, once again, 
Some people report them, some people don't. Uh, and there's been a lot of work about the crocodile human conflict in public education, safety awareness programs, things like that in Australia to, to theoretically reduce the numbers as more people are encroaching on their territory. Now, when we look at the Nile crocs, I found data just um, from South Africa and Swaziland from 1960 to 1984. And in general, there was a believed to be maybe like 300 a year, but it's, it's, it's hard to say exactly. Um, and so overall, that kind of gets you close to your 1,000 number, um, but we don't have all the countries in Africa reporting. Um, in Mozambique, they did report that it is one. It is the mammal, or excuse me, it is the animal that does kill the most. And so, yeah, hippo is definitely. I think Chris busted that myth, which I can't wait to tell John because he's always. Like, oh, <laughs> hippo the most. And I'm like, I think we have a new contender here. So, <laughs> uh, but then when looking at some of the the super fascinating history of of man-eating crocs that have been known to be around for the most part. The one I honed in on first was, I love his name, Gustav the Crocodile. And he is a large male from um, Burundi, which is a tiny state in East Africa. Mm -hmm. And he was, he is and was, I guess, was and is a notorious man-eater. There's been a lot of documentaries about him. He's supposed to have killed at least 300 humans. What? Yes, and um, this is on the banks of the Ruzizi River oh my and Lake Tangiyakni. I said that totally wrong. Can you say but, that again? Uh, no, I'm kidding. I, ta- <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, Tangi- I want to get it right. I got to work on my uh, my my accent here. Let's see, Tang and Yiki. I don't know, but anyways, I got the the Ruzizi River. That's easy. I got that right. And it's just he terrorized this region from. More like recently. And so because of that, there's been several documentaries about Gustav, which two of which I watched. And I think there's even some more things out there. And he is the biggest crocodile that has ever been seen, Corbin. And you're going to I know what you're doing tonight. Tell your wife I'm sorry. I know I am. I'm already planning. I'm already like, where did you oh, find this documentary? Link. Oh, yes. please do. Oh, yeah. Yes, because one was aired in 2004 on PBS, and then there oh. um, is another one that's a little less and a little less about Gustav and more about the Croc conflict that was in 2014 on Animal Planet. So wow. I'll talk about that here in a second. But this is a big boy. He was about 18 to 25 p- feet wow. and approximately 2,000 pounds or a ton. Oh. So you know Crocs. That's, yeah. that's a big number. Oh, and yeah. yeah, and basically – he several attempts in the past like 20 to 30 years have been made to catch him um and they just have not been successful he in fact he when um viewed up close in one of the documentaries it shows that he actually has rows of scars on one of his shoulders from machine guns oh my goodness um probably from poachers or other people trying to take him out and then he has a right uh, on the other side, he has a right scar on his shoulder that they think maybe is from a poacher. Um, but he, so he does, he is scared of humans and there hasn't been a lot of deaths in the more recently. Uh, like so whenever, so he's still people, swimming around. Well, he was last seen in 2015. Oh. So we don't know, but typically when these man killers or man eaters are, are, are caught, there's usually some, you know, some braggery. I don't know if that's News. the right word. Yeah. They, they, celebration or at least like hey this is him and a lot of times they'll they'll examine the contents of the stomach and things like that mm-hmm. to, to see if they got the right gator or croc um and so no nobody's ever done that because uh there's a lot of a lot of people that wanted him out of the area um but in general what happened was is a lot of researchers came down um that are like worked really hard to try to capture him safely and not and not harm him and so there's a whole nother uh documentary about that called capturing the killer croc and oh sorry that was the one in 2004 the one in um 2014 oh was called operation yeah crocodile man eater where they were trying to capture him and uh they had no luck he was just smarter than them and it it's so yeah gustav is legendary and we never well, once again we don't know exactly the numbers uh researchers uh 
had been down there and talking to locals and things like that, but he was definitely a big boy and uh, really smart. And then I think after a while, probably just scared to be around people because of so many people trying to get him. Were there were it mainly kids and elderly people that he was feasting on and, and women washing the clothes? I could, yeah, yeah, yes. I mean, I couldn't find a specific breakdown of it, but yes, it was either kids playing by the waterside mm. or women washing clothes, things like that. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, totally opportunistic, but definitely, um, you know, definitely a, a man eater. And even the villagers, though, of course, they were scared of him or whatever, but they even, they know that their, their, their ecosystem and their waters and their land is changing. And they even suggested in, in an interview that is because of lack of fi- the rivers being mm. overfished and, and lack of fish. Well, so, yeah. and I mean, a lot of times, yeah. uh, and I, I don't always feel like I see this in, in the United States, but a lot of times in other countries that I've traveled and talked with people that live more off the land, they're definitely a lot more connected to it mm. and they can kind of since they depend on their livelihood for it. They can see the patterns of how the rivers are changing and things like that. So, absolutely. Uh, and then the other, probably one of the most famous uh, man eating crocodile interactions was called the Burmese saltwater crocs. And this is allegedly the worst recorded crocodile human disaster in the world, according to the Guinness World Book of Records. And I sent this one to Chris because he's such a history (laughs) and like an army kind of uh, buff. And so this, of course, has to do with in January 1945 during World War II, um, basically the, uh, the island was a small little island off the coast of Burma. And it was occupied by the Japanese army, but the Britons and um, and some in, um, Indian troops got together and like were trying to take it over. And they, as they were trying to take it over, they basically cut off and blocked off and bombed, if you will, the fact, the ability for these Japanese soldiers to get out and get back to their ship. And so they were pushed into these salty marshes oh. of the island. And so the story goes about a thousand Japanese soldiers were succumbed to saltwater crocs. Mm-hmm. And, but I had to do some digging and I, and I, there, there is some literature about this, but one, the main one that I found was mostly not myth busting, but myth kind of altering. And the gentleman that originally recounted this uh, was a biologist and he was also um, a person, I think in the British army, and so he had a lot of interest in wildlife. He wrote about this and got people's attention about it. And But it turns out that he actually wasn't there. And one of his first written documents about it, he said, a thousand troops succumb, some to drowning, some to gunshots, because mm-hmm. they were fighting, of course, and then some to crocs. So that's what he originally said about it. And then since then, the story is kind of, evolved into this like oh a thousand japanese soldiers perished because of these burmese saltwater mm-hmm. crocs mm-hmm. but of course i love dorky scientists they're they're basically well i mean the biggest problem i have with that is like if thousands of crocodiles killed and massacred all these soldiers in like one night or 24 hour period then how are they surviving on this island before a small little mm-hmm. island like what were they eating and mm-hmm. uh so it was probably a mix of drowning, being shot, mm-hmm. and then, and then of course, probably yes, some saltwater crocs. Because no, they're not gonna they're not gonna pass up a a meal, right? Mm-hmm. But yeah, very very well known, and you can it's there's a Wikipedia page and every and everything. But that's why I always start with Wikipedia and then go to Google Scholar. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> go to Google the, Scholar from there. And then lastly, we got to give a shout out to Whiteback. He's um, about a 5.8 meter long saltwater croc, and his nickname was Whiteback because he have a he had a unique uh, white marking on his back. And he got pretty famous in uh, Sarwak, Malaysia, and he killed about 13 people. Wow. So, and he was around for years. They kept trying. And that's the thing. I think these. Obviously, I learned that crocodiles are really smart, but I think these man eaters are extra smart. And so he, he evaded capture for many, many years. But, um, in May, 1992, he had his last victim who was a woman, um, in the water. Um, and, uh, then they were able to, I think, catch him. Um, so yeah, Yeah. it's pretty, pretty interesting stuff, but 
My last comment was one of the documentaries that I really, really enjoyed. And I'll send them both to you, uh, Corbin, and maybe we can, we can put them on our show, no- show notes. Is There's um, a PBS documentary series in 2014 called Operation Maneater. And they covered uh, the crocodile, the polar bear, bear, and the great white shark. Hmm. I was trying to send you the great white shark, but I couldn't get it. Uh, I had to be, I'd be like a special member. But I was able to watch the Nile crocodile one. And, it, of course, it talked about Gustav and all that that I'd already watched. But my favorite part was is that a, science, a team of scientists uh, led by Dr. Patrick Ost, he's pretty famous if you Google crocodile and his name, he went to this region in Namibia that's uh, maybe it wasn't Gustav. I think it was maybe a different one. But anyways, he went to a, re- a, region, a region in Namibia's Chobe River that's known to be the croc attack capital of the world. And, and in fact, uh, attacks are growing probably because of, well, the animals needing more resources and more people being around. And he wants to work really hard to find a safe way to let the crocs not attack people and eat them and let the people keep living their normal lives. And so he doesn't want, the, a lot of them are you know, hunted, unfortunately. And uh, so what he has done is he started a whole research program and he is trying to basically, he knows that, that crocodiles are really smart. In fact, he, had, he works with a research or rehabilitation slash research center somewhere. I don't know if it's in Namibia or another um, mm-hmm. African country, but where they have, they have a, a uh, croc farm basically. And he has worked with the trainers there and they've been able to use operant conditioning, positive reinforcement training to train these Nile crocs to know 30 commands. And I'll, I'll send you the video and you'll have goosebumps. These guys will stay, come open their mouth. I mean, do all of this for like reward based training, which is what Chris and I do a lot of and have done research on. And we do it in horses. And of course it's always talked about in dogs and dolphins and things like that. But I was just blown away. And so anyways, he came up with this cool idea. He wants to use shock aversion training um, paired with a bell. And so to train um, the crocs, that if the, if the, when the villagers go down to the water side or doing anything by the water, they ding that bell. And then a croc has already had experience with a bell and a shock would hightail it the other way. And so it's all about his experiment doing that and having um, obviously like all science, having a lot of failures but then having some I'm just, the failure uh, hold of on. dinner I'm, bell. It's yeah, I was just going to say yeah. dinner bell. Like, what? Oh, I'm like, I'm a wet duck. I know, I know. But he's not, he's not a kid or a but cow, do you, guy. But do you realize, like, no. I train my animals with, like, a bell and a clap, like, and they know it's dinner time. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, it's yeah, completely yeah. opposite of well, what he, I've Well, he ever... has to, he's dealing with a lot of rural villagers, so he has to do something, you know, he's not going to pass out clickers and whistles I'm and sorry, stuff. sorry, but I'm just and so... so... But oh, yeah, so this, he did have a little success too. And so anyways, it's pretty, it's pretty interesting because <laughs> other than that, other... I'm sorry, I'm just like, what? Is that, it that whole, you built that whole buildup of. You watched of... the video. <laughs> but, you watched the video. But what about the croc that didn't go through the training? That's I the dinner bell. You. It's like, I oh, will... what's this? Bonk. I <laughs> wait a minute. I can just imagine getting eaten Ooh. going, wait a minute. I'm, I'm hitting the bell. <laughs> Like, it's alerting them to come to you. I'm so confused. <laughs> Trust me, you'll watch this video and you'll be like, whoa, because they hear the bell and they literally scatter. Okay. The other okay. way. All right. Okay. So he knows what he's doing, uh, why he picked a bell. We'll have to, we'll have to, one of us will have to get him on and ask him why it was a bell and not something else. But it is, you want something loud, obviously. Yeah, no, it makes sense. And, and, for, and something uh, cheap. I mean, you know, it's cheap and easy. When it's but not also, about money, it's about the money. Someone told me about yeah. it one day. So that's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's that's right. And so the other things they've used historically in some African regions is like fencing and nets, like along the water to give mm. the people a little room to work on. Um, but those depending, of course, in Africa, when the rains come in and the high water, those fl- flood a flood away. And so, you know, there hasn't been a, a silver bullet yet. Um, as far as how to stop the attacks. But in general, I don't think any of these quote unquote man eaters are really acting out of wanting to attack men. I think they're just, they're hungry and there's like not as much food and there's more competition and there's a lot more people. 
And I think they are smart. And so they probably well, do learn that it's an easy target. And we're easy. We probably taste delicious and we're soft, right? We're easy to chew. It sounds yeah. bad, but think about it. We're just, you know, we're, we're hairless. Well, some of us, Chris, maybe uh, not you, but <laughs> not <as much laughs> we're, we're naked. Yeah. It's like a beard. Well, but we... for them. Although me during this COVID, it's... <laughs> 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 I can just try to carry myself. Oh All my right. goodness. Well, we're running long. Um, we got to cover Jaws. We, we have, have to, cover to. Jaws. Chris, do it. And you know what? This is, yeah, I, I love talking with you guys. It felt like yeah. I can't believe it's been over an hour and I know. Minutes. Always flies by. Yeah. Always flies by. All right. I'm going to start with the uh, the infamous USS Indianapolis. If we go back to Jaws, the movie, Quint, the captain, now he's the one, If you, I, I, I hope I'm not ruining it for anybody, but gets chomped at the end, right? In, in Jaws's mouth. Hey. That's what happens. <laughs> yeah, Just kidding. Yeah, okay. So, anyways, in the story, they're they're in there, and he's talking. Uh, God, it was the scene where they're in the boat at night. And the boat's going up and down. I could just see it now. And he's talking about the USS Indianapolis. He was a sailor on the ship. And he talks about hearing his friends get killed, like getting dragged off and eaten by sharks. And that's why he turns into this anti-shark, I'm going to kill every shark in the ocean type guy, right? So that's where it is in lore or in the movies. Now, the USS Indianapolis is actually recognized as one of the worst shark attacks in history. Quickly, what happened was this was a cruiser that we sent the nukes over to the Pacific Islands. So the Indianapolis was on a secret mission by itself, and it just took off across the ocean from San Francisco uh, to the island of Tinian, I think it was, where they, they dropped these bombs off. On the return trip, it got torpedoed by a Japanese submarine, right? And they were by themselves. And they were on a secret mission, so the U.S. Navy really wasn't tracking them. Mm. So, you know, the, and, and the boat had like 1,200 sailors. It's a, it's a tragic, horrible story. I mean, you just want to cry for, for these these young kids. So 800 of them went into the water. And they only pulled out 317 or 27. 327 survived. Oh. Yeah. So wow. they they were in the water for about five days. And the story is most of them were eaten by sharks. Oh, my God. That they would just be floating there, and all of a sudden a guy would just go under. And they'd see fins, and oh. guys would be screaming, and there's just nothing they could do. They just huddled up. And it's just the, the the story was they just were just getting killed left and right by sharks. Are these great whites the or just different uh, bull sharks, so tiger? Probably. I, I mean, if bull, tiger. Mm. I don't know if great whites. I mean, great whites are in the South Pacific. So They're not really like tropical, really. I feel yeah, like. More cold really. water. Yeah. No. So, you know, it, it makes sense. I mean, you have 800 sailors. Some of them are, are hor horribly injured, bleeding. In the water, thrashing about. Sharks are just responding to their natural instinct. And so they're going to go in and investigate and then maybe take a little nibble or a bite. And, mm. and, and, and they're also eating the corpses, you know, the sailors that died. So that kind of led to a lot of these sailors being killed. Now, they don't think hundreds and hundreds of sailors died the estimate the high estimate i saw was about 150 died to shark attacks over the oh. five days which is still huge i mean that's mm -hmm. a huge number but they don't have a true true idea of how many died to sharks because some of the guys they're dehydrated they were losing their minds they would go uh, they, they would start drinking salt water sure. which would kill oh. them uh. Yeah. Other guys took off their life jackets and just swam deep, thinking it was fresh water under. I mean, just all this stuff happened. Mm. So, you know, the sharks, yes, were, were a problem, but I think some of this other stuff contributed. By the way, they think the number one shark that uh, was attacking them was like the oceanic white tip. Oh. So, there was other sharks like tigers and some of the others, but the oceanic white tip is the one they thought would probably be the most because it's at the surface. Mm. That's kind of where they their surface feeders. So, so that was probably the the one recorded incident of a horrifying, documentable shark mass shark attack. I'm sure during World War II, you know, some of these other horrible conflicts, 
other things like that probably happened uh, that just wasn't documented. Well, wasn't yeah. Incre- oh, yeah. Sorry to interrupt, Chris. Mm-hmm. I was just uh, wasn't Jaws based on a true story though a little bit, or based on some something in the coast of like New Jersey or New York, but it nothing. Was- I mean, obviously exaggerated, but we're. I think there were some a summer of a couple shark attacks uh, mm-hmm. up a river in Jersey, and I oh. think it was like four people were killed, three or four people were killed, and they they attribute that one to bull sharks, okay. not a great white. Yeah, that it was probably a bull shark because it was going upriver. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so I didn't realize it was based off, like, actual shark. I guess it would make sense. but well, I, or, yeah. or maybe not based off of, but that was, like, the inspiration for the writer, mm-hmm. I think, maybe. or That's what I read. Yeah. All right. So let's go to, 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 to the true data quickly. You know, I know we're running long, so I'll just sum this up. Because unlike the crocodile, which is a real concern around the world, Definitely. Sharks, sharks really are not. Um, in our episode 162, we really go into this. And but we they talk get about the, all the media attention. Like, they do. They do. I mean, have we heard about, has anybody heard about a croc no. attack in Africa or no. Australia no. this summer? Australia no. sometimes. Australia sometimes. But yeah. Uh, but we've all heard about the shark attacks. Oh, yeah, obviously. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and we talk about this in our, in our tiger shark episode um, where we go through some of the data in 2019, there was 140 shark attacks uh, reported throughout the world. Uh, there was only five fatalities. Okay, so between four and six per year is about normal. And uh, the, the the fatal ones last year were off Maui, uh, Reunion Island, uh, another one, and I think the Bahamas. There was uh, one, and I think one in Australia. Um, so, you know, shark attacks six per year on average Hmm. people killed per year in the, in in the world or the U S in the world, in the world, U S is about one. Yeah. Yeah, And there, and there are more attacks, bite attempts, but they like let go because they're like, oh, this is a yeah. Twinkie. This does not yeah. taste like pork. <laughs> this tastes like Twinkies and Doritos yeah. and Mountain Dew. No, thank you. Yeah. 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 Now I will say this year. I mean, what I don't know what else can happen this year. I mean, just a we, we started the year with the Australian fires, and I, it, that seems like a lifetime ago. Uh, it's been just been a bad year, 2020, a, a bad year for for sharks, shark attacks. So so far this year, there have been was it uh, 18 uh, six fatal attacks just in Australia alone. Mm. So there's been eight deaths so far this year. So it, it's above average. But six in Australia, and, and I, I want to highlight this because we in our, you know, if anybody wants to know more about why, episode 163, we talk about, we talk to these filmmakers, Envoy Cole. I don't know if you've heard about this one, uh, Corbin, but they talk about, they do this documentary about the use of nets and drum lines in Australia. Now the, the drum lines are, they go and put these drums out with bait and they catch and kill these sharks Hmm. right off the beaches. So imagine there is a bunch of chum in the water with a big hook, with this big piece of meat floating around that's attracting sharks to a beach area. I mean, how does that make sense? Or to the coastal areas? It doesn't. No. So, and the other thing is the nets. So they, they have these nets the nets what go Angie? Do you remember it goes? They go what twelve feet down? Yeah, so it's, it's, it's kind of like goofy. <laughs> when I first, I was halfway through the interview and I was like, wait. So the nets don't. If the water's forty feet deep, wherever they're baiting it, because it's a little ways off the, the beach. I don't know how many yards. Five hundred. I can't remember. It's five hundred yards or more. But oh, so wait. The water's forty feet deep and the nets only twelve feet. Yeah. So. They, if a shark really wanted to, it just would swim under it yeah. or, around, or around it, and it was just like it was just like this aha moment of like, well, if you are gonna do something, do it right. Like, don't cheap out. I mean, I don't really understand. So it, it's it's hard. We don't live in Australia, but it's, it's it's a practice that's taken place in Australia for a long time, and it used to take place in, um, I believe, off the coast of southeastern Africa. Um, but they've, they've not, they've since stopped it cause the data just wasn't there to support it. And it was, there was a trial in Hawaii, of sim- something similar. And within, I mean, 
very shortly after starting it, the Hawaiian authorities or whoever the researchers were like, this is not working. This is mm-hmm. making the matter worse. Mm-hmm. And, and that's just for, uh, the sharks, but I couldn't believe all the other animals that do get yeah, caught up in the net because sea they turtles, don't fish, exactly. They're not yeah. exactly. They can't see it, and they're just swimming along. And so whales, whales, whales dolphins. Yeah. They had a they had a whale uh, get a whale calf uh, oh. get caught up in one. So yeah, it's 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 a very misguided uh, attempt to protect people on the beaches. And I think they're 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 saying, and what these filmmakers are arguing is that they're actually attracting more sharks to the beaches leading to more human wildlife conflict with the sharks. And obviously most of the shark attacks that happen, it's mistaken. They bite and let go. Uh, Maybe, you know, and that's kind of their hunting strategy too: bite your prey, let it bleed out and go back and eat it, you know, with a surfer or somebody like that, they usually get to shore and they're okay. Um, But I think Florida by Angie is the uh, shark attack capital of the world. Right there. Uh, oh, I the, still just, swim. Yeah. <laughs> so I but... just ch- I just check uh, the sh- uh, the shark data trackers from like O Search and things like that. Oh. Just make sure that you know one of the big ones isn't like swimming under the pier when we're by the pier or something. Yeah, but it's it's you it's know so... six six a year. It's so rare. I, it's I was so rare. driving there is probably more dangerous. Of Way course. more dangerous. Clearly living with my dog and yeah. riding my horse and. <laughs> Feeding and petting cows. I'm going to have to stop that. Yeah. <laughs> I will never stop. I will never stop that. I love cow noses. Oh, and cow tongues are the best. Just to, have, Wait, to, lick to you. eat? Oh, to lick you. I was no. like, oh, I was like oh, my God. God. I don't want to offend anybody who does does do that. But no, no, no. The cow tongues are always so Oh, I don't care lick. if I offend people. That's disgusting. With the taste <laughs> yeah. buds, whatever. Oh, that yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Sorry, no. off topic. So <laughs> the moral of the story is mosquitoes <laughs> suck. They're the worst yes. animal on earth. <laughs> they yeah. kill so more of us I than pro- anything. I probably have the highest threat here in Florida. I've got mosquitoes. I've got alligators. Uh, alligators. Sharks. I've got sharks. Yep. So let's see. Hopefully, I'll, hopefully, I'll be around for our next uh, round table. <laughs> Better be. Better I know be. you guys. I just want to thank you so much. I love our roundtables, and I just appreciate you looking at this. I know it's kind of a we're always trying to promote you know wildlife conservation and trying to show animals in a good light. So I know that focusing on man eaters is not exactly the brand and the image we want out there, but I found it fascinating. And once again, we've learned. I mean, I've learned a lot, but a lot of this is rare. And this is why they've made history. And this is why it does fascinate us because it doesn't happen every day. And it's, it's just, uh, I don't know. It just, I guess brings us back to, I I guess the early days as, as humans, you know, on the East African Mm -hmm. plains trying to have to avoid lions and hyenas. And so anyway, it just still fascinates us. Yeah. Day. And we, we complain about traffic here. Right. I mean, come right. on. Yeah. <laughs> but no, it was definitely, it was a fun yeah. deep dive. I'll, I'll, I'll send you the links to some of the videos that I watch and you can enjoy them. And, and also for me, it did give me a lot of hope out there too, that there are, especially with crocodiles, uh, the research that I was looking into, there are people that are fighting for them and that don't want to just have them culled because there are places, uh, I believe in Africa and I'm not sure about Australia, but where they, once in a while they do call the mm-hmm. crocodiles um, that live mm-hmm. near people and things like that. And so there's researchers out there that are fighting hard for them and saying, Hey, no, no, we can think outside the box, get out a cowbell. And try- <laughs> <laughs> I have to I see the away. data on this because that's the most uh, ridiculous thing I've ever I heard. Think they're still collecting it. How about that? Oh, I bet but they what, are. What, or or <laughs> I, like, you know, you, every, we can, everybody can wear, and the village can wear shirts with eyes on, on the back and um, of their shirt and things like that for some of the, for some of the larger carnivores. And so there are, there are solutions where we're allegedly the, you know, the most intelligent animal on the planet. And obviously we, do some of the most killing for them, you know, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Uh, So we should put our minds together for good use and keep looking at these solutions and keep taking data because you, you mentioned it. I I agree. I want to see the cowbell data myself, but I like, (laughs) I like there's smart people out there working on these solutions and fighting for crocs and several of these other notoriously feared animals because they shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That was uh, good. It was fun. It was fun. We, I can't wait to do the next one. I, we'll see what we pick out of the hat. So I know <laughs> you guys fun. come up with one now. I don't. Yeah, cool. please. I would love to do it. Chris and Angie from the All Creatures Podcast. Thank you once again so much. Thanks, Corbin. Thank you, Corbin. 
Thanks for listening to the Animals to the Max podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with friends and family. Also, if you haven't already, hit the subscribe button. It really helps me out. As always, if you have any guest suggestions, if you want to email me personally, head on over to CorbinMaxi.com. And if you haven't already, check out our social channels. You can follow me at CorbinMaxi on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. We'll talk to you next time.